the day of Pentecost. The first verse of Acts 2, there was a statement, Now when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were with one accord in one place. Now that one verse has a lot of depth of meaning to it. We understand that, I think, most of us in this room. This was the first Pentecost following the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We had the promise of the Holy Spirit that was given on the day of Pentecost. That was poured out. So when the day had fully come, a lot of meaning. But every Pentecost leading up to Acts 2 and every Pentecost since, when the day had fully come, also has a depth of meaning. Because every Pentecost, we count 50 days. Every Pentecost, we count seven weeks. So one of the names of this feast is the Feast of Weeks. We count seven Sabbaths to the day after the seventh Sabbath. And we know all of this instruction from where? You could, you could tell me. Like Leviticus 23. Let's go to Leviticus 23. That's where we're going to start. So Leviticus 23. Now, I got there really fast because I put my ribbon because I knew where the speaker was going. Verse 1 of Leviticus 23 says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, The feasts of the Lord. Whose feasts? The feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations. These are my feasts. So whose feasts are these? Right? They're not the feasts of Israel, although Israel received instruction to keep these feasts. Now, hopefully we take ownership of these feast days, but they're not our feast days. These are God's feast days. It's very important to keep that locked in your mind, and I hope you have it already, but I'm emphasizing it again. These, God says, these are my feasts. Then the very first one, verse 3, says about six days you shall labor, Right, six days work shall be done, but the seventh is a Sabbath, a solemn rest. So the Sabbath is mentioned first. And then, you know this, we go through. Verse 4, we have Passover. Then we have talked about unleavened bread. Verse 9, we have the instruction for the wave sheaf. And there's other messages that have gone into detail. A, there was a very good message a year, last year from C.J. Williams. <laughs> Hopefully that was recorded. But he went through the wave sheaf timing. So you can spend some time and go through that. Then we get to verse 15. And it's important that we had the instruction of the wave sheaf because we count the 50 days from the wave sheaf. And the wave sheaf occurred on the day after the Sabbath. So on the first day of the week during unleavened bread is when the wave sheaf occurred. And so then we have this instruction, verse 15. And you shall count for yourselves from the day after the, the Sabbath... From the day that you were brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be completed. So Pentecost itself is a confirmation of the weekly Sabbath because we have to count seven Sabbaths to the day after the seventh Sabbath. Count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath, just in case, you know, God's word says it. Verse 16, it says, Then you shall offer a new grain offering to the Lord. And then we have... Verse 17, we have the instruction about the wave loaves. So the counting started with the waving of the sheaf, and then the 50 days ends, right? Then we have the waving of the loaves. It's like the product of that harvest. And then we have verse uh, 19. Uh, it says about the offerings, and then those offerings, verse 20, were to be waved with the wave loaves. So we have all this instruction. Verse 21, it says, And in that, and you shall proclaim on the same day that it is a holy convocation to you. You shall do no crushing work on it. It shall be a statute forever in all, gener in all your dwellings throughout your generations. So, a holy convocation. We are here keeping a holy convocation. So we have all this detail of instruction. I went very quickly through it, as you can, you know. You know, as I said, there was a, I know at least one sermon that I heard last year that went through detail about the wave sheaf. 
All this instruction. And then we get to verse 22. And verse 22, if you read it quickly over it, you almost think, was that just tacked on because it, it, it ties in with the harvest? Verse 22, what's it say? It says, when you reap the harvest of your land, hold on, there was all this intricate instruction about keeping Pentecost, and then verse 22 says, when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not wholly reap the corners of your field when you reap. What? what? This is part of the instruction for Pentecost. Nor shall you gather any gleaning from your harvest. You shall leave them for who? For the poor and the stranger. I am the Lord your God. So part of the fabric of Pentecost instruction is that we are to take care of the poor and the stranger. I find that quite significant. Let's go back a couple of chapters because these words were said more than once. Just go back to chapter 19. Verses 9 and 10. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not wholly reap the corner of your field, nor shall you gather the gleanings of your harvest. And you shall not glean your vineyard. So, right, the grain, you would leave the corners, but also your vineyard. Well, some people are happy with that. <laughs> I like the vineyard. Nor shall you gather every grape of your vineyard, and you shall leave them. For who? For the poor and the stranger. I am the Lord your God. And notice the way this is capped off, right? The way verse 22 of Leviticus 23 was capped off with an I am statement. You shall do this. I am the Lord your God. And then let's go to, just for the repetition's sake here, look, Deuteronomy. Because when God repeats things several times, there's importance to it. Look, uh, Deuteronomy 24, verse 19. And we'll go, read through 22, verse 22. It says, When you reap your harvest in your field and forget the sheaf on the field, you shall not go back and get it. Now, this is, goes contrary to our modern-day thinking. You know, today, somebody has a, a farmers have the combine come by harvester, right? They've got, they've got quotas to fill. That's money, <laughs> right? If, if uh, grain spills out of the combine harvester, sheaths fill, spill out, what, what would a farmer do today? He'd go back and pick it up. But God says, no, you leave it. It shall be, second half of verse 19, it shall be for the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. So now we add in a little bit more here. The fatherless and the widow, right? And very often, they become in a place where they're poor. That the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. So now we have an indication of the harvest blessing here. Because... This instruction to take care of others, to take care of the poor, part of the meaning of Pentecost, it says, you will be blessed in all the work of your hands. I'll put my hand up for everybody. I want to be blessed with the work of my hands. I said I'd put my hand up for you. <laughs> That's right. And there's somebody on the front row. He never listens. But we're friends, by the way. That's why I can... When you beat the olive trees, you shall not go over the boughs again. It shall be for the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. Right? So some of the olives stay on the tree, don't go back. When you gather the grapes of your vineyard, you shall not glean it afterward. It shall be for the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. And then verse 20, it says... And you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. Therefore, I command you to do this thing. So as we're going through this message, I hope you are making connections to the spiritual lessons. I plan to bring some out, but there's more than I can bring out in one sermon. I'm just telling you up front there. So be thinking about the spiritual lessons that connect here. This one, remember you were a slave in the land of Egypt. 
There was a time when we were slaves to sin. Even those who <laughs> grew up in God's church, there were times when they were pulled with the ways of this world. Therefore I command you to do this thing. Right? Remember you, where you were once. Once you were a stranger. So we have all this incredible instruction. Now, is there anywhere in God's word that exemplifies this instruction that we have for Pentecost about leaving the corners of your field? Hopefully you're all ahead of me here. Because a book that was traditionally read on Pentecost and leading up to Pentecost was, and it would have been the scroll, they unwound the scroll and they would be reading the scroll of Ruth, the book of Ruth. Don't you find that significant? It exemplifies this, what we read in verse 22 of Leviticus 23. This principle of gleaning, of leaving the corners of the field. So the title of today's message, I don't know if it was written down already. Some, I did send it in this week to the, um, where I was supposed to. But the, the title of today's message is Pentecost, Ruth, and the Harvest Blessing. So it's Pentecost, Ruth, and the Harvest Blessing. So let's go to the book of Ruth. The timing of this book is important. It's, well, well, the verse right before we start the book of Ruth, um, the end of the Judges, verse 25 of chapter 21 says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Go to verse 1 of Ruth. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled. So what was the timing of this book? The time of the judges. This was a time of political and moral chaos. Hmm, does it, sounds a little bit almost like what we've got today. That We won't dwell on that. Political and moral chaos. So what happens here? The time of the judges ruled. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. Why? Because, I, I missed reading that, but that there, because there was a famine in the land. So there was a famine in the land of Bethlehem, Judah. So they made a tough decision. So Elimelech, and Naomi and their two sons, Mahlon and Chilion, made a tough choice in their life. Have, you, have, you, have any of you ever had to make tough choices? Have you ever had to move? Have you ever had to change your employment? Have you ever had to think, oh, is this the right choice to make? And I know this would never happen in God's church, but maybe somebody even said, you know, if you hadn't made that choice, things would have gone a lot better for you. And in hindsight, that could have been said to, Ruth, to Elimelech and Naomi. Have you ever had to make a tough choice, a medical choice in your life? I've had people say to me, you know, um, going natural is the way to go. Well, that's still a choice. It's still an intervention because you're changing the way you are. Right? The, there's tough choices we have to make. And this, then it goes from, they go from a famine, they travel, they think, okay, well, this, this is going to be a good choice. Then what happens? Elimelech dies. So Naomi is there with two sons. And then what do her two sons decide? Her two sons decide to marry woman of Moab. Again, oh, was that a good choice? I'm not sure, guys. <laughs> Ah, oh, Moab. So they marry Orpah and Ruth. So we have all the, some of the, a lot of the players already here in this story. And then what happens? A lot of you know what happens, right? You've read this. But we go from Elimelech dying, and then the two sons die. So then you're left with three widows. And Naomi has lost her husband and her two sons.
And then these next um, verses, verse 6. So then Naomi, she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab. And she, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. So there's a little bit of a play on words there because they're going to return to Bethlehem, which means house of bread. And so now there's a decision. Okay, we're going to re- I'm going to return. And then it, both her daughters-in-law, and this is, again, striking for the example that Naomi must have set, because her daughters-in-law say, we're going to stay with you. We're going to support you and help you. And Naomi says... No, no, no. And she, she tells him not to. Orpah listened to Naomi and said, okay. And Naomi and Orpah give each other a farewell kiss. Right? It's a, it's a parting kiss. Ruth, she, she had a little bit of stubbornness in her. <laughs> and she said, and she didn't give Naomi a kiss. She clung to her. She clung to her. And then we have these words which are used um, still in modern day or variations of these words of, of Ruth speaking to Naomi in verse 16 and 17. So read these words. It says, But Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave you or turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and the Lord will be. And sorry, and there I will buried, be buried. The Lord do to me, and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. Right, and we have variations of these words in marriage ceremonies. Right, till death do us part. We have all these variations, this commitment. And, it's, and what is a marriage? And marriage is one of the themes in this book. And what is marriage? It's a covenant. So we have the theme of covenant through this book of Ruth. What, what's Pentecost? <laughs> it's about the New Testament commitment, the giving of the Holy Spirit, but then telling people what do they have to do? Repent and be baptized and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, you should already know this, but I want to emphasize. Naomi was in a very low place in her life. How low was Naomi? Well, I I would put it to you, and you will read these words, but I'll put it to you that she was close to giving up. Has anybody been there? Don't raise your hand. Verse 13, let's read these words of hers. When she's imploring her daughters, right, she says about, would you wait till, you know, I've grown sons for you to marry? She says, um, would you restrain yourselves from having husbands? No, my daughters, for it grieves me very much for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone against me. Have you ever felt a little bit like that? You're like, come on, God. <laughs> right? And, and you, you have this conversation back and forth with God. And he said, really? In verse 20. So Naomi and Ruth, and I could go into th- talking about the, the, this journey back. <laughs> right? Even that was treacherous, right, in the time of the judges. Naomi and Ruth return, and, and the people of Bethlehem say, is that, is that Naomi? <laughs> Verse 20, and so Naomi replies and says, do not call me Naomi, which means pleasant. Call me Mara, bitter. <laughs> Verse 
Again, have you ever been in that position? Call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. Oh, she's in a low point. And who helps bring Naomi out of that low point in her life? Physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, low point. A stranger and a foreigner. Her family, a daughter-in-law. A Moabite. But what happens in this story... <laughs> It's, it's a miracle that a Moabite was able to come in part of Israel. But she actually becomes an example Israelite. So what does Ruth do? She goes to work. She goes out, and because of this instruction that we see in, under Pentecost, right, this, this law of gleaning, of leaving the corners of your field, she goes out to the corners of the fields and starts gathering. What's her motivation? We heard in, in the first message questioning, what is your motivation for what you do? No, Ruth's, Ruth's motivation was to take care of Naomi. Now, she was also helping herself, right? She was collecting food, but her motivation was to take care of her mother-in-law. And it seems that Naomi wasn't up to doing that herself. So she goes to work in, in chapter 2. And Ruth is noticed for her work ethic. She's noticed for her standards, her morals. In fact, she is referred to as a Proverbs 31 woman. And she's a stranger and a foreigner. And she's really looked down upon in, in the cultural scene, but not from her example. Let's pick it up in verse 4. Now behold Boaz, and so now we have the next character come in. And I think a lot of you know this, but Boaz is really a type of Jesus Christ, right? A, a small type. <laughs> and Christ is the, obviously the... The Messiah. But Boaz here. Notice this. Now Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. Now just stop and think in our modern time. You know, I don't, I, well, if, if one of you have had a boss that came in and did this, tell me about it. I'd like to hear it. But could you, I, I just, I've had worked for se several different people in my lifetime including when I was working for the church, and none of them came in and says, said, the Lord be with you. He was giving a blessing to those working for him. And the, look at the response from his workers. And they answered him, the Lord bless you. And this was a heartfelt response because Boaz took care of those who worked for him. He was a man of integrity. In fact, the name Boaz, I'm going to say it now in case I forget later on, the name Boaz itself means man of strength, and swiftness. It has two, two meanings in there. And the man of strength is the same meaning as David's mighty men. Just think about that. This was a man of strength and a man of action. And it was a man that cared for those around him. What an example. As I said, he's a type of Jesus Christ. So, so this. So then, and you notice, Boaz noticed what's happening in, 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 the field, in his field. And he says to his servant, who was in charge, so the head, the head foreman in charge of the reapers, whose young woman is this? So this is incredible, you, the words of how this, the example of Ruth. So the servant who was in charge, verse 6, of the reapers answered and said, is it is the young Moabite woman who came back from, with Naomi from the country of Moab. And she said, please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and has continued to work. 
has, I say, has continued morning until now, though she rested a little in the house. So she started early morning. Oh, she did take a little rest, but she's still working. She's still out in the field working. Then Boaz. It says, then Boaz said to Ruth, you will listen, my daughter. So even the way he refers to Ruth is a very caring manner. Listen, my daughter. Will you not? So listen, my daughter, will you not? Do not go to glean in another field, nor go from here, nor, but stay close to my young woman. Let your eyes be on the field with the reap which they reap, and go after them. Have I not commanded the young men not to touch you? Again, this is, goes to the integrity of Boaz. Because this was the time of judges, right? everybody did what was right in their own eyes, and Boaz said, have I not instructed my young men not to touch you? Remember, he's a man of strength. And his, his word had weight, and he said, so you... A powerful man. You imagine it, you come up to you and they say, do not go near. Right, right in your face. <laughs> That's the sort of the, <laughs> the sense you get. You take care of this young lady. The respect, the integrity, the morals. And you notice her response, right? And, 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 and oh, I should finish verse 9, right? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from the young men, from what the young men have drawn. Now, this is against the culture of the time. Women drew water for men, was the culture. So the fact that Boaz says, Ruth, you drink from the water that my young men draw, again, shows the the detail and how he's making sure she's taken care of and the respect that has been given. So, again, sometimes I've, se- I've read some commentaries and they, they, they seem to say that, that Ruth is the one that made the first move. Well, Boaz noted, noticed Ruth first. Again, think of the spiritual lessons. And Boaz answered, oh sorry, so, so, so Ruth's response. She fell down on her face, bowed down to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? Have any of you said something like this to God and said, God, why me? I have. I don't know if you, know, you can speak for yourself. But why are you sitting in this room today? Why did you take notice of me? And Boaz answered, and I love this. Boaz answered and said to her, It has been fully reported to me, young lady. <laughs> Precious one, whatever, you know, just the, the sense that it has here. It has been fully reported to me. So it was the example that she set in the way she conducted her life. All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your household and how you have left your father and your mother and the land of your birth and have come to a people whom you did not know before. Again, does that sound familiar? Right, we are to put, right, put our mother, father, all God first. And then I love this verse 12. This is like, uh, this, the way this reads is like um, Boaz is giving a prayer of blessing for Ruth. He says, The Lord repay your work and a full reward be given you by the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. So remember that, that, that phrase here, under whose wings you have come for refuge. Okay, and hopefully you're connecting that with other scriptures in God's word. Under whose wings? So Boaz watches out for Ruth. Notice verse 14. 
It says, Now Boaz said to her at mealtime, Come here and eat of the bread and dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. So she sat beside the reapers, and he passed parched grain to her, and she ate and was satisfied and kept some back. So she got plenty, enough for her to eat, and then she kept some back for who? For Naomi. And notice, I don't know if you caught it, because I read when I, how, the way I read through there, but did you catch who passed through the grain? Boaz, he's the boss. He's the owner. Boaz was serving Ruth. Again, just think of all these, the spiritual lessons here, right? And and then we find out, we'll read some of this, but that Boaz is a kinsman. The word kinsman, goel, means redeemer. Sometimes we say kinsman, redeemer. It's almost like saying redeemer, redeemer. But it's, it's all part of it. There's a lot more to this, that meaning there. Who is our Redeemer? So, so Boaz takes care of Ruth. Um, verse 15. And when she rose up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves and do not reproach her. I, I couldn't help but think of the spiritual analogy here. Somebody coming into God's church, right? They, they start to read God's word. They start, they're kind of in the corners of the field. They're getting little bits of, starting to get some understanding. And then God opens up and says, okay, come right into the field. And I'm, we're going to give you full sheaves of grain. You know, we, we rejoice when someone who used to be in the church comes back, don't we? Naomi was coming back from a foreign land. It still wasn't easy. You know, sometimes people coming back, they might come one week and then you see them in a, maybe two or three Sabbaths. It's still hard coming back. But what a joy that it is. And when she... So... And I just, it's wonderful. Boaz says, okay, and now actually... Purposely drop some. <laughs> Leave some behind. Because, and who's right behind? Ruth. Coming through. They're, they're, they're harvesting. And then, oh, here you go. <laughs> they're almost handing it to her, right? So let some grain from the bundles fall purposely for her. Verse 17. So she gleaned in the field until evening and beat out what she had gleaned. And it was about an ephah of barley. And when I looked this up, an ephah is about 30 pounds. So this is way more than a normal day's gleaning. And Naomi notices. Right, go to verse 19. The response from Naomi when she comes back, verse 19, and her mother-in-law said to her, where have you gleaned today? Right? There's 30 pounds of, of grain. And remember, where had Naomi been? In a really low place in her life. Where did you work? Blessed be the one who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law, with whom she had worked, and said, The man's name with whom I work today is Boaz. And Naomi's like, I know Boaz. Boaz knew Naomi. Right? They were relatives, right, through, through, through the marriage to Elimelech. But, and notice this. Verse 20. Remember the, where Naomi had been, right, in this low place. And I put it to you that she was close to giving up. But because of the work of Naomi, the blessing of Boaz, and God directing things here, this response from Naomi, from going from this low place, incredible tragedy, horrendous. Have, you, have any of you faced tough times? Right, I speak as a fool. 
I know you have. I have. She says to her daughter-in-law, Blessed be the Lord who has not forsaken his kindness to the living and the dead. And Naomi said to her, The man is a relative of ours, one of our near kinsmen. So she, go, she, she still comes to the point of giving praise to God. Who helped her out of that low place? Ruth. It's a very powerful story. After all that utter despair, she's able to put trust in God to see them through. Then chapter 3. Chapter 3. We hear now a bit more about this kinsman. One who redeems. And as I said before, who redeems us? Let's go to chapter 3, verse 1. We'll read probably through about verse 8 or so. It says, Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, shall I not seek security for you, that it may be well with you? Now, this is a book of love, but it's not a romance, you know, a romance novel you get off the shelf. This is a book of love, and the love here is chesed, which is... Outgoing love. It's love for others. It's, it's giving to others without thought of return. So Ruth has helped Naomi. Boaz has helped Ruth. And now Naomi's thoughts are to help Ruth. What's bringing Naomi out of that low point in life is actually helping someone else. Again, credible lesson for us. Now Boaz, whose young woman you were with, is he not our kinsman? Right, our redeemer. In fact, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Therefore, wash yourself and anoint yourself. Right, and you, you can have all the fun with this. Naomi, you're you're a little bit sweaty. <laughs> You've been working in the field fields. Right, wash yourself, get in, put your best clothes on, put some perfume on. All of us look pretty good here today. We've washed, we've dressed, we've come to God's holy day. We're coming before God. So where did I get to? Okay, so, so she said, to anoint herself, put on your best garment, and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. So she, she had a, put a, cl a cloth over her head, right? She tried to cover her face a little bit and cover her nice clothing, I believe, and try to stay off in the corner somewhere. And it says, but do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. So what was happening here? That had the blessing of this harvest, right? A good harvest, but it's still the time of the judges. So what does the owner do? He stays near the grain. This was a normal practice, to lie near the grain. So until, wait until he's finished eating and drinking. So he probably had a really good meal, like a little celebration of this great harvest. And then he goes to sleep. Then it shall be when he lies down that you shall notice the place where he lies and you shall go in, uncover his feet and lie down and he will tell you what you should do. Now, my reaction, I'm, I'm not Ruth, right? I'm, I'm not a lady, but I hope you know that. <laughs> but Naomi is saying, okay, what you've got to do Stay in the quiet, and you're just gonna, when he, he's sleeping in a sound sleep, you got to lift up, you know, the little blanket, the, the coat that he's got, what he's got, cover himself. Just get under that coat at the end of his feet and lie down. And then, he's, then he'll tell you what you need to do. I'd be thinking, are you sure that's the right way to do this? Are there instructions in God's word 
that we read and sometimes you think, oh, is that the right thing? The fact that you're here today, there are many people out in the world who think, that, that's a strange thing. Okay, don't they keep the seventh day Sabbath? So they met yesterday, day 49 of the counting, the seventh Sabbath yesterday. And now, they're, now they're meeting again, two Sabbaths in a row. What is the deal with those people? There are other things we get asked to do, and people think we're strange. But notice this response from Ruth. Verse 5, and, said, and she said to her, so Ruth is replying, all that you say to me, I will do. Oof. Wouldn't we, how good would we feel if we could always respond like that to God's instructions? And this, the, God was behind this, right? So she went in down to the threshing floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law instructed. And after Boaz had eaten and, and drunk and his heart was cheerful, right? So maybe there was some wine. We don't know fully, but it was a full meal. That's enough for me to sleep. <laughs> right? He feels good about the harvest. He's He's cheerful. He went, down, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain and she came softly and covered his feet and lay down. And she had to do it very softly because he was in a sound sleep because the next verse it says, Now it happened at midnight that the man was startled. So I believe she was lying down there. And then what happens with me, I roll a little bit and it's like, oh, Hey, what's that? Who's touching me? The man was startled and turned himself, and there a woman was lying at his feet. And he says, who are you? And I think he said it quietly because he didn't draw attention. But still, he's like, I would, no, I'd be thinking, what? <laughs> who are you? And she responds, I am Ruth. And you notice what it says in verse 9. Take your maidservant under your wing, for you are a near kinsman. Did, now, are you connecting that already, the verse 12 of the previous chapter? Verse 12, the blessing that Boaz gave to Ruth was, The Lord repay your work, and a full reward be given to you, the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. This was a blessing he gave to Ruth. Now, when he gave that blessing, did he know that God says, Oh, and by the way, Boaz, I like that prayer of yours, and I'm going to you, you're going to be used as an instrument to fulfill that and provide under whose wings Ruth will find refuge. Humans couldn't work this out. This had to be God-ordained, all these things that are worked out here. Now, I'm going to just read a quote because there are, sometimes there's commentaries that, and different people that might say there was a, this was a sexual encounter. It was not. This was an encounter of love and respect and taken care of. This is from um, the Expositor's Bible Dictionary. This is, Those who interpret a sexual relation in the events reflect a 20th century cultural conditioning of se sexual permissiveness. They failed to appreciate the element of Ruth's trust that Boaz would not dishonor her. Okay, but this is the time of the judges. This was a big step. Ruth had to put her trust in Boaz. So back to the quote. He said, would not dishonor her whom he wanted for his wife. They failed to appreciate the cultural taboos of Ruth's time that would have prevented a man of Boaz's position from taking advantage of Ruth, thereby destroying her reputation and perhaps endangering his own. And, and we've already read the way that he took care of Ruth. Boaz would not dishonor Ruth. So he says, he tells her, and I'll let you read the details, but he says, I'll take care of things. There's a, there is a nearer relative, though. Now, have you ever been told something? Yeah, oh, okay, okay, is it going to work out? I've had that recently in my life. I thought, okay, it's going to work out. No, it's not. No, it's going to work out. No, it's not. And I don't know how Ruth was feeling 
Right? She, said, she said, I'm putting my trust right, in the instructions, and I'm, I've done all this, I've done my part. Was Ruth still anxious? Well, verse 18, Naomi says to Ruth, Sit still, my daughter. Mm, does that sound familiar to any other verses in God's word? Stand still and see the hand of God. Sit still, my daughter. So I think Ruth had to physically sit, sit down and stop pacing, maybe. Sit still, my daughter, until you know how the matter will turn out. Right? It's out of our hands. I've been there. Have you been there in, in your life? You do everything you can, and then, okay, it's up to others now. It's up to who? It's up to God to direct things. For the man will not rest until he has concluded the matter this day. Remember the Boaz, the meaning of Boaz? Man of strength and a man of swiftness, a man of action. So Naomi knew who Boaz was, and she said, he will conclude this matter today. Okay, I'll sit still. <laughs> Thank you. Take care of things. Chapter 4 of this book. Then we have, and I'm not going to go into the detail here. There's, there's so much, but we have um, 10 witnesses. We have the near relative happens to walk along right at that time. They sit down and have a, have a chat. Right, today we might um, say, okay, let's, let's have, have a cup of coffee and sit down. We have the shoe covenant. We have the exchange. But we have this contrast between two men. The one man, and notice I'm saying one man, because his name is not recorded. Whose name is recorded for all people? Boaz. The other relative's name is not recorded. If you find it, you let me know. I think the nearest you can get is, um, hey, you. <laughs> His name is not recorded. Now, it doesn't mean he's a terrible man, but he was interested in the land, but then, oh, that's a lot of responsibility. If the children we have, that'll be for the inheritance for Elimelech, right? Okay, so I've got to pay this money and then it's not... Hold on. Boaz steps up. Boaz, the redeemer. The goel, the near kinsman. It's very powerful. And we, we know what happens in the story, but... I just want you to pause here. And just stop and think. Who could have foreseen, right? God did, obviously. Naomi and Elimelech and the two sons leave and go to Moab. Naomi returns with only her daughter-in-law. And then the way things turn out, Ruth, the stranger, the foreigner, becomes part of the lineage of King David and the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Who, who, could, who could have guessed? Who could have worked it out? And I know I've said this, but I want to repeat it. No human being could have worked out this scenario. The faith in God that is shown here, and the faith in God's purpose, contribute to such miraculous results. The faith shown by Ruth, the faith shown by Naomi, the integrity and the, just the, the man of Boaz. What a guy. Let's read those verses. So chapter 4, let's start in verse 13. Verse 13, so Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and when he went to her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Remember, she didn't have any children with Chilion. Then the woman said to Naomi, now I want to just think about this. 
the support that women give. And I think we have a supportive group of women in this congregation. I know we do down in Tacoma. The support that women give. They gathered around Naomi. They gave her this encouragement. They celebrated with her. Remember, this is probably some of the same woman that said, is that Naomi when she was returning? And they said, blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a near kinsman, and may his name be famous in Israel. Do we remember the name Boaz? We sure do. And may he be to you a restorer of life. Remember, where was Naomi? She was... She had nothing left. Except she did. God was with her the whole time. May he be a restorer of life and a nourisher in your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you, who is better to you than seven sons, has borne him. What, what, what praise to Ruth. Your daughter-in-law is better than seven sons. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her bosom and became a nurse to him. This is another miracle, right? Naomi becomes a nursemaid to the child. Also the neighbor woman gave him a name, saying, There is a son born to Naomi. Now we know it was Ruth, right, had the child, but she cares for this child. And some people are blessed with grandparents and help out with their grandchildren big time. And they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now this is the genealogy of Perez. Perez begot Hezron. Hezron begot Ram. Ram begot Aminadab. Aminadab begot Nashon. Nashon begot Solomon. Solomon begot Boaz. And Boaz begot Obed. Obed begot Jesse. And Jesse begot David. This is King David. And if you want to go to Matthew 1, you can see the rest of the lineage there. In the lineage of Jesus Christ. A stranger and a foreigner. Who, became, who went from being the daughter of Moab to being the example Israelite. A Proverbs 31 woman. And we have this theme of the spiritual harvest. This harvest blessing. I want to read another quote. This is from Halley's Bible Handbook. Probably a lot of you have Halley's. <laughs> they have a little, just a little bit, you know, on each sort of chapter. I don't always refer to it, but I did this time. So just a little bit, that's a couple of paragraphs actually about chapter two of Ruth. And this is, this is interestingly, about a mile east of Bethlehem is a field called Field of Boaz, where tradition says Ruth gleaned. Adjoining is the shepherd's field, where tradition says the angels announced the birth of Jesus. According to these traditions, the scene of Ruth's romance with Boaz, which led to the formation of the family that was to produce Christ, was chosen of God. 1,100 or more years later as a place for the heavenly announcement of Christ's arrival. So that was from Halley's Bible Handbook, note on chapter 2. Now the way it was worded there was 1,100 years later was chosen. Well, the way I think about it, 1,100 years previously the place was chosen. In fact, it was chosen before that. God's hand was involved. And remember where they'd gone, right? Naomi lost her husband. She lost her two sons. Ruth lost her husband. They were widows. They were the poor. And because of the principle that is part of the fabric of the meaning of Pentecost, they were taken care of. The corners were left, or the fields were left. I find it very powerful. Hopefully you've been picking up and making connections with spiritual lessons, more than what I've said, because there's more than I can give. 
I do want to leave you with a few here. Spiritual lessons. A Messiah is for all people. Our Messiah is for all people. Acts 2, I, I refer to that. This is the day of Pentecost. We often we rightly go to Acts 2. In the book of Acts, remember I, I referred to verse 1, but this, all this happens. We have the rushing mighty wind. We have the tongues of fire. We have the gift of hearing where people hear in their own language what is being said. We have this powerful sermon from Peter, and it comes down to verse 38, and it says, Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What's the, what's the greatest harvest blessing? What's the greatest gift that we have is the gift of the, of the Holy Spirit. Some of you may be sitting here and thinking, okay, so we should be giving to others. We should take, you know, I don't have much money myself. Well, I put it to you that in this room are the richest people in the world because you have the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the ways that you can give to others are incredible through using that gift. And the power of the gift of the Holy Spirit is only seen when it goes into you and through you and out helping other people. And in Leviticus 23 was recorded, these, that verse 22, to take care of the poor, those in need, to take care of others. And then verse 39 says, for the promise is to you. Oh, excellent. And to your children, right? It's a, I love that. It's available to my children if they choose to take it up. And to all who are far off. I've met a lot of people who are far off. God says this promise is for them. As many as the Lord our God will call. How many is that? It's above my pay grade. I don't, well, I don't, I'm not on a pay, actually. But... <laughs> It's way above my pay grade. All right, that's for God to decide. As many as the Lord will call, I think it's a big number. Big number. Acts 10. All right, so Peter gave that powerful sermon in Acts 2. You notice what he says here. Uh, Acts 10, verse 34 and 35. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, this is, this is great. He says, in truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. Oh, I'm, I'm glad you're on board, Peter. And this, he's the one that gave the powerful sermon in Acts 2. And he's still coming to a greater depth of understanding. But in every nation... Whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. This is, we're talking about God's plan of salvation. I've got to say this. Um, my wife said in my ear, you know, we have Mark Graham here. She says, you know, he writes, he writes hymns and can explain God's plan of salvation in about four, ver four or five verses. It takes you an hour. I love that Peter was still, ah, I perceive that God is not a God of partiality. Don't you love that? God's impartiality is a, is a bountiful blessing that neither Ruth, Boaz, or Naomi could have fully known when they were just trying to do the right thing. And we are privileged to know this truth. Okay, another one I want to make sure I get out here is the harvest blessing we receive is to help others. If you haven't got that already, the harvest blessing that we, we receive is to help others. The greatest gift pictured in the Feast of Weeks 
the Feast of Pentecost, the Feast of First Fruits, and, it's, and it mentions First Fruits as well in Acts, in, in Leviticus 23. The Feast of First Fruits is the gift of this Holy Spirit. And verse 22 of Leviticus 23 said, you're to take care of the poor and the stranger. You just take care of the people. We are blessed to receive the gifts from God. God wants to see how we give to others. And if you want to tie in the sermonette, what, what is your motivation? What is your heart? Let's go to um, Psalm 41. I'll finish here today. Psalm 41. And I've got to tell you what a blessing. Because this instruction about taking care of others itself comes with a blessing. Because God says, if you follow my instructions, then you're also going to be blessed. Psalm 41, verses 1 through 3. We give because we want others to prosper, others to be blessed, to receive the blessing of the harvest on this harvest festival. Psalm 41 and verse 1. We'll read verses 1 through 3. Blessed is he who considers the poor. The Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. The Lord will preserve him and keep him alive. And he will be blessed on the earth. You will not deliver him to the will of his enemies, the Lord will strengthen him on his bed of illness. You will sustain him on his sick bed. Who, who wants those blessings? <laughs> oh, wow, I do. What a blessing. What a blessing. My daughter told me I should be saying that more often. What a blessing. Pentecost, Ruth, and the Harvest Blessing.